Which turbocharger is better? Garrett, Borg Warner, this is part two. All right guys, so we spoke a lot about the differences. We went into a lot of detail about Garrett features and Garrett uh, uh, um, designs and the Borg Warner features and Borg Warner designs in the previous video, part one. This is part two. We're gonna carry on from where we left off and uh, I hope you guys enjoy that. I'm gonna then obviously give you my opinion like I promised you in the beginning of part one and uh, let's get straight into it. Here we go. All right guys, next topic I wanna to talk about is the bearing housing and the location of the cooling ports or cooling jackets, the size of the cooling jackets, and obviously the comparison between the Garrett old style, latest G series style housing, and obviously the EFR in comparison. Okay, what we have here is the GT, Gen 1 GTX and Gen 2 GTX bearing housing that was found on the Garrett ball bearing turbochargers. Now, they are water cooled. That's your oil in and opposite side oil out. Water in and or out. Water in and or out. So you can use it in that side or out that side and vice versa, right? There is a cutout of this bearing housing. We've done it specifically in a way so that we can expose the oil feed galleries, which you can see clearly displayed over there. At the same time, I wanted to dissect the water cooling jacket, just to get an understanding of the design, the routing, and the actual sheer dimension of that jacket that is obviously expected to cool the bearing cartridge. Now, this is the bearing cartridge, the original bearing cartridge, which uh, Garrett had with the plastic cages and obviously was upgraded late, later in the GTX Gen 2 style with your um, metallic cages with the locator pin located on the middle, the center of the outer race. That is basically how that bearing cartridge or the outer race situates inside of the bearing housing. Here's the new G series cartridge, which fits perfectly. They have not changed the outside dimensions, the length of the outer dimensions, etc., etc. All they've done is they've changed the materials and the design of the inner race on one of the inner race uh, pieces. Now, let's have a look at the water jackets. Now, if you look at the actual main body of the bearing housing in front of you here, you'll see that the water jacket is really, really small. I'm gonna point to it at the end of a shaft. Look at that water jacket. Now, I understand this water jacket over here has an oil feed coming past it, so you can't extend this up. Obviously not, but as this water jacket comes past this inlet for your oil, it needs to extend back up to the top. So if you look on the opposite side, which is here, you will get a clear picture of that. It looks like it extends quite high up, but look there. It butts up against the wall over there. Now let's measure the height of this from the thread it's gonna be a bit difficult because I'm gonna to have to measure it from this face, from that face there to that face there because the vernier can't get in between the actual thread and that face there. So let's just do this. And we've got a value of eight millimeters, seven millimeters. So that's not much area. Let's get the other piece and put it back in here. So that is your water inlet. That distance over there is seven millimeters. Let's look at it from the other side. Okay, so we've got the water jacket that comes in, butts up against that wall and flows around the side of the bearing cartridge. Remember, the bearing cartridge sits over there. The water will come into the, the housing surrounding that and flow around there. Now, I would be impressed if that flowed all the way around but it doesn't. It's got a big volume over here, but it reduces to a tiny little section here, understandably to allow the oil 
fitting to come past, and then as it comes past, it extends back up again. But where it extends back up again, have a look at how small the actual orifice is for that water to get around to the other side. The water cooling design on this specific bearing housing was great in the day, but as the, aeros, the aerodynamic designs change in the compressors and the horsepower was pushed up, um, you started to find that the EGTs and the temperatures and the loads put on your cooling system also increased. So these become, became inadequate and that's where you'd start to find even during normal operation, you would find these bearing cartridges discoloring like that. Now, this is from a failed bearing system. However, this is still the typical discoloration you would see. Straw to blue, blue to purple, purple to black in extreme situations, specifically for drift cars. And that is the type of discoloration you will experience even under normal street driving conditions. So it reflects the previously inadequate cooling systems from the GT and the Gen 1 GTX bearing housing um, design. At the same time, Turbo Direct used to manufacture metallic cages to upgrade the plastic cages that were found originally in these bearing cartridges for the, with the previous versions or the previous, the initial models of the bearing cartridge. And we used to do that specifically for your drift and circuit type cars because even though uh, the guys were racing around a track, let's say 20 laps or whatever the case might be, they'd come into the pits and they'd let that engine idle, the plastic or the thermoplastic cages would still deform because of the inadequate cooling design of the bearing housing at that time. If you have a look at the G series, which is the latest bearing housing uh, offering from Garrett, the cartridge is exactly the same diameter, it slides into the, the housing like that. We have water cooling ports in, out, in, out, whichever way you please on both sides of this bearing housing. So if we have a look at the actual port on the inside, it does appear to have a slightly larger port. I don't know if the camera can get a, a clear picture in there just to show where the thread ends and where the back, the back wall is. We will, uh, in time, we'll dissect one of these, cut them open, but it doesn't seem to have a hugely upgraded water cooling jacket, and it's definitely not advertised by Garrett that they've upgraded the cooling system in these turbochargers. Um, however, the bearing housing has now changed to incorporate a V-band connection to the turbine housing, and obviously uh, the previous ring, adapter ring, which went onto the bearing housing on the outside and was held together with a circlip, has been done away with. And obviously this part of the bearing housing forms your backplate. So what's interesting is the oil inlet with the orientation of the bearing housing at the moment is at the bottom over here facing upwards. So the oil will enter the bearing housing facing upwards. I'm holding it upside down for a reason so you guys can see this section over there. Hey guys, so what I basically showed you there on the, uh, the new G series uh, uh, bearing housing design with regards to the, uh, the little air, or should I say the oil dam that basically create or collects the oil behind the bearing cartridge in this area over here would probably explain one of the reasons why they've moved this locator pin on the outer race. So the shiny ground section of the bearing cartridge sits higher than the unground section and that allows obviously with that little orifice you've just seen inside of the bearing housing to create a bit of an oil dam and or a reservoir as such which obviously then would feed uh, your two grooves with the little holes over there which will then obviously pass the lubrication onto the balls in the cage on either side. Now, what I want to bring to your attention as well is the oil discharge hole in the actual bearing housing that's cast in the bearing housing, which I'll show you in a second. Hey guys, so what I want to show you is the actual discharge hole on the inside of the bearing housing, which then flows toward the pot belly or the outlet uh, port, the oil outlet port. Um, that's a, a bit of a square hole over there. It's not entirely abnormally large. 
And uh, if you just keep that in mind, I'll do a direct comparison to the Borg Warner in a couple of seconds. Right, guys, so the next obvious comparison would be your Garrett G series versus your Borg Warner EFR series bearing housing. Now, you get an option from Borg to have a iron type bearing housing and like the Garrett and you get an option for an aluminium type bearing housing. Now we don't bring the iron type bearing housings in. Uh, we only bring the model with the aluminium bearing housing in for obvious reasons. They are both perfect. They both work just like the Garrett works. But I, in my personal opinion, would prefer to use an aluminium bearing housing for various reasons. Number one, the lightweight. Number two, the fact that aluminium dissipates heat a lot better than what iron does. It's got a much better reaction in terms of cooling when subjected to coolant as opposed to what iron does. So that's the obvious elephant in the room over here that the Borg material choice is aluminium. It's much easier to manufacture. Uh, it's much cheaper to manufacture. It's easy to correct any problems. Cracks can be welded. Um, if there's any adaption that you want to do for a larger housing and you need to weld on a uh, extension or a, an adapter or whatever the case is, you're able to work with an aluminium housing is the point as opposed to v being very limited with an iron cast iron type housing where you are unable to successfully weld onto it um, in most cases. Now the obvious thing would be the bearing which slides into the housing. And this little collar over here basically mates up against that area inside of the bearing housing, which basically allows you to distribute some of the load or a lot more of the load into the actual housing itself. Now, if we look at the inside of this bearing housing, you'll notice the same discharge hole that we've just shown you with the Garrett. Have a look at the size of that hole in comparison to the smaller square hole from the Garrett bearing housing. The restriction, oil restriction, has already been machined into the bearing housing itself, which you'll see that small little hole on the inside over there. And on your screen, you'll notice that the oil restrictor has already been machined into the bearing housing, even though you get supplied a fitting to go with it. Now, in most cases, this is something that a lot of people don't know about the oil supply to uh, bearing housings, both in Garrett as well as uh, in any ball bearing turbocharger. The demand on lubrication for a journal bearing turbocharger is a lot higher than what your ball bearing design systems require. So what you need to keep in mind is that you should never use more than a dash four, an AN4 or quarter inch fitting for the supply of oil to a turbocharger that runs ball bearings. Anything larger than that is going to cause all sorts of issues. If however you stay in a climate that is extremely cold, we would suggest you run a dash six line, or if you're running a line longer than about 18 to 20 inches, uh, supply line, oil supply line from the engine to the uh, inlet of your turbocharger's bearing housing, um, specifically for people where it's critical actually, for people living in colder climates, run a dash six supply line, AN6, as opposed to the AN4. Um, this will prevent a lot of uh, problems. On your screen now, you will see the Dash 4 fitting, which comes with the EFR turbochargers, regardless of whether you are using a iron or aluminum housing. Next feature I'd like to bring to your attention is obviously on the oil outlet, as you can see in front of you right now, you've got two threaded ports where you can actually run a flange with whatever fitting welded on or if you've got those CNC machine flanges which bolt with a gasket onto this face over here you can obviously use that but take a careful look there's thread cut on the outlet of the actual orifice uh, which I believe is a 3 8 NPT or a dash 8 AN size 
um, thread, which you can basically take a fitting and screw directly into the bearing housing without having to use the uh, flange face with the gasket. That's something that uh, the Garrett bearing housing does not feature. Right guys, what you see on your screen now is a photograph of a cutout of the Borg Warner EFR series turbochargers. And there's two red rings which depict dual compressor and turbine piston ring seals. Now, Garrett have released their dual ring seals on both the turbine and compressor only recently with the release of the G series turbochargers. Borg Warner have always had the twin piston ring seals since its inception in around about 2010, 2011. So it's just another feature that Borg have always had in their lineup. And uh, it's really, really interesting and actually a great feature to have knowing that you can run slightly higher angles in your installation than uh, what you'd expect. All right, guys, the next topic I want to bring to your attention is the photo you see or the picture you see on your screen now showing you a cutout from the top of the uh, bearing housing. This is the EFR bearing housing or the EFR style bearing housing. Basically what you're looking at is a cross section depicting the size of the water jackets that are used for cooling the bearing cartridge. You will notice that they are huge. They've really, really been designed specifically for racing in mind, abuse in mind, high temperatures, and the cooling potential of this specific design is far superior than almost all of the other designs I've seen, no matter what the name is on, on the, uh, the turbocharger. Right guys, so this is basically a cross-sectioned turbine housing from your GT28, GT25, 28 and GT30 style uh, turbine housings, which also went on and was used in your GTX 2867 Gen 2 uh, turbochargers with internal gate. They use these specific housings. Now, this specific housing, there's your inlet flange. Obviously, you can see the, the T25 in that flange has been cut in half, obviously. And the diversion path is basically a 90 degree to where the swing valve is. Okay. Now, I know I've got another video on the YouTube channel where we discussed gas diversion path when we compared the G25 to the uh, EFR 7163. And there were a couple of comments about... Um, the, di the diversion path or the angle of the diversion of the gases going from the inlet face to the actual swing valve. Well, I'm just going to reiterate about that now. This style turbine housing basically has a 90 degree angle that you need to, or a corner that you need to go around before you get to the actual swing valve, which is opening and closing now. Now, if you have a look at the Borg Warner, yes, this is a twin scroll design. Um, however, let's just look at it from this face. There's your inlet face over here. There is your swing valve over here. So basically your swing valve is over there. The diversion path from the inlet goes straight up against the back of the disc itself or your swing valve itself. So it does not have to turn around corners and it's really, really short in terms of the distance that it needs to travel to, for the gases to basically get and butt up against the back of your swing valve face. Now, if we have a look at this twin scroll design, you'll see that both ports, both inlet ports, have got a diversion or a gas diversion that lead directly to the swing valve. Okay guys, so what you're looking at here is on the twin scroll EFR design, you'll notice that they actually take a feed from both scrolls, feeding directly to the back disc, or should I say the, the, the back face of the swing valve, um, which will basically give you a really, really good wastegate control or boost control based on the fact that we're actually taking an equal feed from both of the scrolls. You'll notice that the previous video, I'll put a link down below in the description below, uh, where at the specific time that I mentioned and did the comparison between Garrett and EFR, the latest G series, uh, the turbo that we took was a, G, a G25 550, I think it was, or a G25 660, internally gated, and we compared the housings and we compared the gas diversion. I think that Garrett 
uh, uh, learned obviously and, and they've upped their game but I believe that they've taken a, a similar design to what Borg Warner have had in existence for the last 10 years and incorporated that into their latest G-Series uh, internally gated housings. The only housings you get internally gated for the G-Series are obviously on the G25s. So they've basically copied or ha have a design really really similar to what Borg Warner already have um, in terms of the gas diversion, the angle and obviously the location of the swing valve uh, um, in relation to the inlet face of that uh, turbine housing. A little bit more on the divided manifold pulsation. So I've just shown you the physical turbine housing from the EFR 7163, the twin scroll version, where we've actually taken two uh, feeds from the inlet face directly to the, uh, the back face or the, 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 the front face of the swing valve. And on the screen right now, you'll actually see that this is not just some thumb suck that Borg Warner dragged out of thin air. They actually teamed up with the Ford Motor Company and they've gone and done analysis between open and divided manifold pulsation. Now, they've picked up that there's obvious benefits to running a twin scroll turbine housing and there has to be proper wastegate control in place for it to work properly, especially when you are running a divided or separated manifold. Now, yes, you will still see a benefit as some of my other videos have explained previously, where if you do not run a separated manifold, you'll still see benefit of using a twin scroll turbine housing. However, a separated manifold has its benefits, especially when teamed up with your twin scroll internally gated turbine housing. Would I use, in my personal opinion, a internally gated twin scroll turbine housing from Borg Warner as opposed to running an externally gated setup? Well, let's talk about the size of the valves that are used in the internally gated setups. On your screen you'll see a picture showing you the two different disc sizes or swing valve sizes, diameters used on the EFR series turbochargers. The 7163 with the twin scroll turbine housing uses a 36 millimeter disc or swing valve. Uh, it is a really, really large valve, more than adequate enough to be able to control, successfully control, linearly control the boost on that specific AR85 or AR80 turbine housing that comes with the 7163 turbo. On your larger turbochargers, you'll find a 42 millimeter disc. So the question is, would I, in my personal opinion, use an internally gated setup with a uh, car, let's say for example an 8474 Black Series, which is a 950 horsepower capable turbocharger, or would I use a free floating turbine housing and an external wastegate? Well, in my opinion, I would most definitely go with the 42 millimeter disc or swing valve with an internally gated twin scroll type setup with the 8474 on a project car, whether it be a four-cylinder, uh, 1J, 2J, RB25, RB26, whatever the case might be, um, I would always choose the internally gated option over an externally gated option, specifically because of the fact that lag comes into play. Okay, so what you see in front of you now is a wastegate flow coefficient versus actuator rod stroke. Now, you're looking at the flow coefficient on the left-hand side and across the bottom of your page, you're looking at, or your screen, you're looking at the rod stroke in inches. In other words, how far the rod on your actuator has to actuate, has to move. Now, if you have a look at the point that is basically circled or squared off in red, you're sitting at six and a half, maybe a little bit more than six and a half, point six and a half of an inch of rod length which will achieve as close to a 1.0 coefficient as possible. So what you're basically looking at there is, and I'm gonna read this out of the Borg Warner Tech document. The flow coefficient is a measure of to what extent the wastegate port area is being used. Now, let me explain. Let's say for example, you have an orifice of 10 mils, uh, 10 millimeters or half an inch it will only be able to flow a certain amount of volume of air at a specific pressure. Now, the bigger the orifice, the more airflow. Now, general terms will depict that when you get to a coefficient of 1.0, you will find that you are using the maximum flow capacity of that orifice. Now, 
we are achieving that with a relatively small amount of rod length, which gives you a very linear wastegate control. That's essentially what this, this picture depicts to you. Um, now let me talk a little bit about wastegate control and size of turbocharger. I have this discussion with a lot of people a lot of the time and I ask them, do you know how a wastegate works? And everybody says, yes, yes, it's easy. You put boost under the valve and the diaphragm squashes the spring and the valve goes up and down and as the valve opens, it dis discharges boost and you put a one bar spring and you'll boost one bar and you put a two bar spring and you'll boost two bar. And no, it's not how it works. Not, not even close. How a wastegate works is Yes, we know the principle. The valve opens its seats. As it opens, you discharge air, etc., etc. Yes, we all know how that works. But my question is actually how to choose a wastegate. How does a wastegate work in relation to boost pressure, engine size, turbine size, flow, flow uh, ability of the compressor, and horsepower of the engine? Let me explain, and then you'll understand the coefficient versus the rod length that we've just spoken about. If, for example, you have a hundred pound per minute of airflow turbocharger, okay, thousand horsepower capable turbocharger mounted to an engine, forget about what kind of engine, forget about boost response, forget about lag, we've got an engine that has got a thousand horsepower turbocharger bolted to it. You want to make 500 horsepower. You need a wastegate large enough that is able to flow 50 pounds of air, 500 horsepower of discharge air. If you have got the same 100 pound per minute of airflow, 1000 horsepower capable turbo mounted to an engine, and you want to make 900 horsepower, you only need a wastegate big enough, or an orifice size on your wastegate big enough to flow 10 pounds of air, or 100 horsepower. Now, with a lower boost applications, you need a larger wastegate. With a higher boost application or higher horsepower application, you need a smaller wastegate. Now, if you look at the picture in front of you, which is on your screen again, you will notice that the graph that you're seeing is very, very linear. Especially for low boost applications, you will get very, very good wastegate control or internal wastegate control, boost control. Um, it's a really linear graph which shows you you're not going to find uh, you will overboost, you'll have boost creep situations, etc., etc. Low horsepower and low boost setups together would normally be working in the range of your coefficient between 0 0.4, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, and 0 0.5 uh, coefficient on the left uh, axis, and at around about 0.3 of an inch of rod length movement. And you'll see that that line is pretty much straight. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a very jagged line. It doesn't have peaks and troughs. It's not up and down. So the point I'm trying to make here is the control, the boost control you'll get using the EFR style and designed turbine housings are exceptionally good in controlling boost, whether it's low or high boost, low power or high power applications. All right guys, so what you see on your screen now is a picture of what extended tip is actually all about. So where your tip height exists on the exducer of your compressor wheel, uh, what Borg Warner have done, and this is 10 year old technology already, is they went and extended the tip on the exducer of the, of the compressor wheel specifically to increase and stabilize flow. Now, Garrett have never done that uh, up until, I believe, and I stand to be corrected on this one, guys, so if I'm wrong, please tell me, but as far as I know, and I haven't confirmed with Borg or Garrett, but as far as I know, Borg were the first guys to actually release the extended tip, especially on their, on their performance lines anyway. Uh, but the picture in front of you basically explains to you what the extended tip is. Uh, that's another great feature that Borg, I believe, were first with and have always used. Garrett caught up at a later stage and have incorporated that with the GTX Gen 1 style uh, compressors. And I believe uh, the Gen 2 as well. The G series has also got a type of extended tip, but the tip doesn't corner off on the outside edge. It actually rounds off again, and I'll give you guys some close-ups of that in another video when we start doing some compressor wheel com uh, comparisons. That's going to be for another video. Guys, next point or next feature that I want to just bring to your attention and discuss is the anti-surge housing. Yes, they've been around for years and years. Holstead have got them, Triple K, Schwitzer, 
Borg Warner, then obviously bought Triple K and Schwitzer, and they fall under the same uh, umbrella. Mitsubishi, IHR, everybody under the sun has got a anti-surge housing. Who was first, who knows? But I can tell you this, that the incorporation of the EFR anti-surge housings and the Airworks anti-surge housings um, were pretty much your direct 90 degree type discharge hole as opposed to an angled upwards discharge hole which you can clearly see on the picture that's on your screen right now. Ignore the abradable seal or the abradable coating shaded in blue. I'll get to that next but what I'm talking about is the actual port um, which basically goes from your inlet to where your inducer wheel basically runs, the inducer of your compressor wheel runs to the little port situated just outside of that. You can see that it's angled at approximately a 40 or a 45 degree angle. All the other anti-surge housings that I've seen um, when it comes to the Garrett GT3582R, um, the part number used to be a dash 14, that went and allowed you to make 675 horsepower out of a GT 3582R from your 650 horsepower was uh, the anti-surge port that they put into that housing. Now all of those housings run a 90 degree um, to the inducer of the actual housing. The Borg Warner guys have actually angled that at a 40 or 45 degree angle specifically to allow for less restriction and a much better discharge. So what you see in front of you now is a Gen 1 GTX 3071 compressor housing. What I want to show you is that discharge port over there. You'll see is at a 90 degree angle to your inducer. So it sits at about a 90 degree angle as opposed to the upward angle or 40 or 45 degree approximate angle of the Borg Warner, which I'll put back onto your screen now. So the angle that I'm uh, showing you now that, that circled in red is essentially the angle that has been used. That what, that's what I call attention to detail, guys. And you know, if you've got somebody in the design team designing just, you, you, designing this kind of attention to detail, it says a lot about the rest of the turbocharger. So keeping this picture on the screen, let's talk about your abradable seal. Now, I've got another video on the on the channel where we started to talk about an abradable seal or an abradable coating um, specifically related to the IHI IS38 turbocharger. Uh, I remember I had a client that uh, bought a turbocharger from us, we sent it down, he was spinning the blade before installation, brand new genuine IHI turbo and they heard a bit of a contact between the compressor wheel and the compressor housing, they sent it back to us, we opened it up, we contacted IHI and they said don't worry about it, it's an abradable seal, it's meant to do that, it will wear itself away and it will not cause any harm to the turbo, the seal or the uh, bearing system and or blades in the compressor housing. So this is basically what they've done with your EFR um, systems or the EFR compressor housings. That's the shaded blue area. And what they're basically talking about is a coating which basically allows an increase in efficiency with boost pressure gains. So it had mixed effects with the initial tests. Um, and you know they they incorporated this into some of the EFR turbochargers initially, and it's been done away with. So if you do have a comp housing that has got the seal in it, don't worry about it. It is supposed to be there. It's not some sort of build up, but uh, it's nice to know that Borg have been experimenting with these kind of things. We've never seen that on a Garrett compressor housing before. IHI use it still today, so. You know, call it good, call it bad, who knows? But at the end of the day, it's something nice to know. Okay guys, so on the screen now is a cross section of the diverter valve or compressor recirculation valve, uh, CRV otherwise known. Um, and Borg Warner have basically incorporated these into all of their compressor housing, specifically on the EFR range of turbos. Would I use it? Absolutely, and here's why. Especially on a streetcar where the response between gear changes, especially when you're driving just inside of boost or just outside of boost and you change gears, you want a little bit of that response to still remain in the system and the diverter valve will basically do that for you. 
Now, if you ever look at the design of this diverter valve, you'll actually see that as the air discharge or as the valve will open to the right hand side, so the blue line at the top facing from right to left, the diverter valve will open, that discharge directs straight through that angled anti-surge housing or anti-surge port on that housing without having to go around corners. More attention to detail. It's really, really nice to know that the guys at Borg Warner have gone to such extents to make these turbochargers with such great attention to detail. Uh, Garrett do not have any turbochargers that have got incorporated diverter valves. I don't believe that even their OEM uh, turbocharger setups had diverter valves incorporated electronic or manual before Borg Warner did. I know that on the Opals and the Porsches, uh, Borg Warner did incorporate those type of technologies uh, long before any of the other turbo manufacturers did, but on the performance range, Borg Warner are the only guys that offer an incorporated diverter valve in their designs. Okay guys, you can obviously see what's on your screen now. That's pretty much your boost control solenoid. Um, instead of going and buying a, an additional solenoid which can cost 20, 30, 50, 80 dollars, depending on if you buy a two, three or a four port solenoid, uh, it's already included and mounted on the compressor housing uh, for you with the Borg Warner products. It's a top of the line, top quality product. Um, I'm going to put the specifications of the boost control solenoid onto your screen now. So guys, what you see on your screen now is basically a diagram of the vent port, the outlet port, the polarity and the inlet port, and obviously your terminals. So it basically gives you an idea of how to connect and how to route your pneumatic lines to and from the solenoid itself. Uh, Garrett on their performance range do not include solenoids. So this is another feature that is included in the Borg Warner range. EFR range specifically not on your Airworks range, um, which makes it that much more, more attractive if you ask me. So the next point I want to talk about is the speed sensor. On the Garrett side of things, you have a speed sensor port which has got a blank, which is basically bolted in with a slight O-ring. It's a small little plastic blank which goes into the hole and it has a O-ring obviously sealing that little section and it has a small little M5 bolt which basically screws into the comp housing, sealing that port off. It is completely drilled all the way through the comp housing into the radius profile, so there's no engineering or drilling required. Uh, on the Borg Warner side of things, it has the, exactly the same uh, speed sensor port designed into the compressor housings. However, it does not have a blank in there. It is not drilled all the way through. You need to do that should you choose to use the speed sensor port or not. Um, there's mixed feelings about having it done and uh, try, having it done by the owner of the turbocharger or a fabrication shop and reliability um, of the actual. <laughs> engineering and the potential of messing it up but at the same time uh, you also have a possibility of a leak depending on the thermal cycling that goes on with the Garrett uh, offering in my opinion I believe having to go and engineer the hole or drill the hole out yourself does lead to potential problems you can drill it skew you can you can muck it up you can break a drill bit off inside of that hole which might render that compressor housing useless so you know not such a great uh, design on the Borg Warner side if you ask me I prefer the Garrett design to be honest however the speed sensor um, or the speed gauges that you get the digital gauges that you are able to get from Bailey, uh, Bailey Engineering, is something that Garrett don't offer. Garrett have got their own gauge, which is uh, an analog gauge. Um, it does have an electronic output, a 0 to 5 volt output, if you want to run that with your data loggers or ECUs or whatever the case might be. Uh, but I don't believe that they have a digital gauge option. And the pricing for the Bailey digital gauge together with the speed sensor uh, sensor kit from Borg Warner actually costs the same if not a little bit less than an analog type gauge that you would buy from Garrett including their sensor. So the uh, you know there's swings and roundabouts with a specific uh, topic but that's the facts and those are the details surrounding that. Right guys so what I want to talk about next is the compressor wheels, the designs, the materials and the engineering techniques that are used. Garrett previously in the Gen 1 GTX 11 main blade wheels used the normal engineering 
uh, practice or technique where they did not use point milling. You'll understand what that means in a few seconds. I'll show you some close-ups. Um, the actual surface of the blades were nice and smooth and they used a normal billet material which was not forged. And obviously the, the, the material specification was chosen which usually relates to either 2618, 7000 grade or 6000 grade aluminium depending on the application, speed, root design, etc, etc. Then uh, Garrett went to the Gen 2 GTX compressor wheels where they did not use a forged material however they used point milling I'll show you point milling in a second and then the G series turbochargers once again carried on with the same engineering technique using point milling on the surface of the actual blade or the material. Borg Warner however have always used a forged milled wheel so they've taken a billet of a specific grade forged that material and then used a normal engineering smooth surface on the compressor, uh, the compressor blades as a engineering technique. Here are some close-ups of the two wheels next to each other. First, I'm going to show you the Garrett. This is a genuine Garrett G351050. You'll notice that there are striations across the surface of the blades. Those lines, those, those marks, they are done on purpose and the reason for that is there are radius profiles between your RZ and RA or your peaks and troughs and you will find that on the front and the back of these blades. On the Borg Warner, this is an EFR7670. This is a forged milled wheel, so it is a material forged and then milled. Have a look at the blade surface, it is smooth. And at the back of the wheel, or the back of the blade, you will see that it is also smooth. The only striations that you will find are coming down between the blades on the back disc area along the entire root profile. So those are the two different technologies and material specifications used with the Borg and the Garrett, the Garrett and the Borg. And uh, it's interesting, they're both successful, they both work well, uh, they're both proven, but it's just interesting information for you guys. Okay guys, so that's the end of quite a long series, part one and two of the Garrett versus Borg Warner technologies and features. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it's been a long one. I hope you guys in, uh, have learned something and uh, I hope it has changed your view on both Borg as well as Garrett. Um, I believe that I owe you guys my opinion as to what turbocharger I would choose if I was building a car, which we are actually busy with as we speak. That's uh, for an upcoming video. It's a project car. We're using a 1J uh, engine, which is going to be quite highly modified. And we're actually going to be using this engine to do back-to-back -back testing from turbocharger to turbocharger, a specific turbo with different AR turbine housings. We're going to play around with changing comp housings on the same turbo, um, etc., etc. But my opinion, in my little bubble, in my little world, as to which turbocharger I would choose if I was building a car would be, without a doubt, Borg Warner. Here's why. You get a lot more features for the money. It costs more or less the same as a Garrett product with less features. I don't have to worry about boost control solenoid, diverter valve. The internal gate is designed in such a way that it will actually outspool and out control, linear control, an external wastegate setup. It's got a much better cooling system. It uses a better material for the bearing housing, which aids in cooling. The bearing design is larger, more robust, more robust, and not as susceptible to overheating, especially under heavy duty, continuous abuse, like for example, circuit rally and drift type applications. It uses a lightweight gamma tie material on the turbine side, which aids in spool. Um, it's proven in all genres of racing, specifically circuit racing. I like the weight benefit that you get from the aluminium bearing housing. 
I like the physical package dimensions or the actual size physical dimensions that is nice and compact. You've got lots of different turbine styles that are available from T4 twin scroll internally gated, V-band internally gated, T3 internally gated, T25 internally gated and you get your free floating non waste gated or non integral weighted uh, waste gated style turbine housings as well. Um, I like the fact that the Borg Warner comes as a complete package. It has basically everything you need to bolt onto a manifold, do whatever pipe work you need, run your oil feed, oil return, water in, water out lines, and go. You don't have to go and purchase a, a whole list of external additional items and then still plumb those in and still fabricate and weld and plumb in, for example, a streamer pipe going back into the, in, back into the outlet of the exhaust or the downpipe of your exhaust, etc., etc. There's a long list of benefits that I like personally about the Borg over the Garrett for the same price point. Get what I'm saying guys. I'm not saying Garrett is not a good product. I'm not saying Borg Warner is the only product out there. Garrett is proven. Garrett is a really, really successful brand. They were the first guys to design a performance range. They were the first guys to uh, uh, prove themselves with ball bearing technology. However, they are lacking when you compare them to the Borg range. Now, where do I get this opinion from? Let me just give you a little bit of thought process as to how I got to what I'm telling you. I've been in this game for over 20 years. I have been a master distributor and still am for Garrett, for Borg Warner, for Mitsubishi, for RHI for many, many, many years. I have been to the manufacturing plants of Garrett. I have been on the production line with these two hands assembling, flow calibrating, balancing turbochargers in Cheadle, in the Czech Republic, in Bruno. I have met and know personally the design engineers, the technical staff, um, the salespeople, the production plant guys. I've worked with Garrett um, and Borg Warner. I'm not just saying Garrett, with all the brands, with all of the companies, all the manufacturers for many years, and I've rubbed shoulders with these guys on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We have done warranty analysis and warranty claims for Garrett. Uh, we have seen and experienced all of the strengths and weaknesses, which there aren't very many of, with the Garrett product, the Borg product, the IHR product, the Mitsubishi product over the years. So the collective experience and hands-on knowledge uh, base that I have personally working with all of these brands has built up my opinion from experience. These are not just highfalutin thumb suck stories which I've come up with. These are based on physical experience with all of the brands and based on that I'm happy to say that in my opinion if it were my car I would go with the Borg Warner hands down bar none. Mitsubishi have got a fantastic product range. IHI have got a fantastic product range. I've also got ball bearing turbochargers, the VF series, which has been designed specifically for the Subaru range of cars. Yes, they don't have a performance range per se yet, but the products are just as good. However, my first choice would be Borg Warner for what I've just uh, spoken to you about. I hope you guys have enjoyed that, guys. I hope you guys are keen to share some comments down below. Let me know what you think. If you think I'm a total beep 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 because of my opinion no problem share it with me i'm happy to hear your side of your story and your opinions if you guys believe that garrett is a better product please share it with me and let's discuss it and let's interact anyways keen to see what you guys have got to say please like subscribe and i will catch you guys next time